This is just a sample of the audiobook. To get the complete audiobook access the link posted in the first comment. The six-month supply of condoms was a strange twist. At that point, we had no idea whether they were connected to the murder. We rounded up several witnesses who had seen two young males, one black and one black or Hispanic, running from the parking lot after the shooting. One woman was driving by when the two suspects ran from the scene. She had to hit the brakes to avoid hitting one of them. She got a good look at him, saying he'd worn a bandana over his face and gray pants. Several others in the area heard Mr. Elshar yelling before a shot was fired. Then they heard a younger man scream out before running away and joining another across the street. Early indications were that Mr. Elshar might have resisted during an attempted robbery. We would soon learn that this World War II veteran, Union electrician, and fitness enthusiast wasn't easily intimidated. He was a strong, tough guy, but he'd taken a bullet directly to his heart. It had passed through his left arm and into his chest, where it punctured his lung, passed through his heart, and lodged in his spine. Breaking Bad News There is no easy way to break the news to the family of a murder victim. We receive no training for it, but we take it upon ourselves to do it as gently as possible. Otherwise, the coroner would do it, and that was the worst possibility. They'd just call family members and say, Your son is dead. It was that cold. I always tried to soften the blow somehow, which was futile most of the time. The heart never heals from this sort of tragedy. As a homicide detective, all too often, you find yourself standing on the front porch in a cheap suit and holding a badge. And then the door opens, and you can see it on their faces. Someone is not home who should be home. They haven't heard from a family member who usually calls. They know it's coming, and you have to be the bearer of the worst news they'll ever hear. I'm very sorry to inform you that your, fill in the blank, is no longer alive. I never say killed or murdered, because those words are like bullets. I just say they are no longer alive and wait for their reaction. I've seen all types. Some people just stare at you. Some laugh nervously. Some scream or collapse or punch the messenger. I've always told my guys to just do it quickly, gently, and as simply as possible, and then be prepared for anything and everything in response. You just never know whether the loved ones will collapse on you, turn on you, or throw you out the door. In another murder investigation, when we told a woman her husband had been killed, she grabbed a rookie detective's tie and went down, yanking him to the ground and nearly strangling the poor guy. In this case, our detectives pulled into the hotel parking lot and saw a woman on the balcony outside room 2G. She looked distraught, especially after she spotted their car. That must be his wife, Looking for him, one of our detectives told the other. Helen Elshar opened the apartment door with her hand in front of her mouth. Oh, God, what has happened to my husband? One detective embraced her immediately because he was afraid she might collapse in grief. Your husband was shot in an apparent robbery attempt, he told her. She slumped against the hallway wall. Her knees buckled, so our detective held her tighter. She convulsed with sobs and moans. How bad is he hurt, she asked. I'm afraid he did not survive the gunshot wound to his chest, the detective said. You won't often see a television or movie detective serving as a compassionate grief counselor. But that's part of the job, too. Some are better at it than others, of course. And this detective was a very empathetic guy. He waited patiently for Mrs. Elshar to gather herself, 
at least momentarily, and then he offered to help her reach out to other members of the immediate family. He knew that the poor woman needed to...